Grumman Aerospace Corporation's F-14 Tomcat is the end product of a major disagreement that erupted in 1964 between the U.S. Navy, then Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, General Dynamics, Grumman, and the U.S. Congress. This intense bickering was the result of a well-intentioned decision in 1962 by McNamara to create a multi-service tactical combat aircraft that would use a basic airframe common to both the Navy and the Air Force. That is your bogey. The extraordinarily versatile but unquestionably overburdened General Dynamics Grumman F-111AB, codenamed TFX, resulted from this marriage, with McNamara arguing that an Air Force and Navy fighter with high airframe commonality would save taxpayers many millions of dollars. The F-111, because it was a technologically precedent-setting program of unparalleled proportions, entered its preliminary flight test program with a number of serious problems. A very serious weight problem, which was caused almost totally by the basic specifications, eventually proved to be the F-111's Achilles heel. It was perhaps the most single important factor leading to the airplane's premature demise. Not too surprisingly, the Navy was not unhappy with this decision. And in fact, a year earlier, quietly began to review an in-house Grumman study calling for a totally new all-Navy fighter aircraft. Almost before the ink had dried on the agreement releasing Grumman from its obligation to the F-111B, the Navy came up with a request for proposals for the VFX, the aircraft which Grumman had already been working on. Grumman was no stranger to building Blue Water Navy aircraft. From cat fighters during World War II to the F-9F Panther in Korea, the Navy's first jet fighter to see combat. The F-10F Jaguar, a cat ahead of its time, was the first fighter with a variable sweep wing, a concept which was to pay off some 25 years later. In between, Grumman designed and built the F-11 Tiger, a longtime favorite of the Navy's Blue Angels, and the Super Tiger, a Mach 2 version which set a world's altitude record. With a strong pedigree behind it and design and planning already underway, it was no surprise when Grumman was awarded the VFX contract in January 1969. From then on, work proceeded at breakneck speed. It was six years since TFX had been given the OK, but the Navy was no nearer to getting its new fighter than it had been then. Only two years were permitted to get the VFX, now known as the F-14 Tomcat, into the air. The same basic engines Pratt & Whitney TF-30 turbofans were used, though as events turned out, these power plants were the one major technical problem to afflict the Tomcat in service. Thousands of design configurations were whittled down to just eight, and then to just one. In some respects, it was not strikingly different from the abortive F-111B. Grumman, confident of its abilities and quite certain that its design would be picked, had started preparing long lead time materials well in advance of the VFX contract. The same Hughes AUG-9 radar fire control system was installed, and two crewmen were slotted in, although one behind the other, and not side by side, as in the TFX. But these similarities were internal. Wrapping was completely different. Indeed, as the mock-up VFX showed, nothing quite like the Tomcat had ever been seen before. Instead of utilizing a conventional fuselage, incorporating crew stations, avionics, engines and fuel, to which were attached the required flying surfaces, below which in turn were attached pylons for the weapons, it seemed as though Grumman had started out with a giant aerodynamic lifting body, with the outer sections pivoted for variable sweep. Beneath this, set far apart, were slung two long engine nacelles, with intake ducts stretching well forward. Since there was no fuselage in the traditional sense, the radar gear and crew stations were housed in a nacelle, which was added to the front of the lifting surface and fared in. Although apparently a patchwork of different elements, the whole thing blended together remarkably smoothly, maximizing lifting potential while minimizing weight. Lots of details were modified, but the most evident concerned the vertical stabilizer. 
the Navy was none too keen on the central fin arrangement, but for reasons of carrier stowage, it was not possible to compensate for their loss and heightening the main tail fin, so twin dorsal stabilizers had to be adopted to give them a cranked gull appearance when viewed from head on. And the front nacelle was resized to give the crew better visibility out of the cockpit. With the contract sealed, Grumman began to tool up in earnest for the six prototype pre-production and 463 production aircraft that were written in. The first flight was to take place in or before January 1971, only two years away. The first F-14 prototype was rolled out at Calverton, New York on the 14th of December, 1970. And a week later, it flew for the first time. Despite the urgency of the program, it was found possible to tweak the design as the assembly of the first few aircraft was in progress. The changes were for the most part cosmetic in nature. Grumman, as usual, had got it pretty well right first time. The Tomcat's second flight on the 30th of December ended in disaster when the hydraulics failed. The crew, unable to control the aircraft, ejected safely. The accident proved to be a minor setback, and by May 1971, the second Tomcat was in the air. Problems of a political nature were looming by this time, though. The VFX contract negotiated between Grumman and the Navy was a total procurement package, allowing for 2 to 3 percent per annum inflation index. All 469 aircraft came within this agreement. The machines to be divided into eight batches and delivered over a decade or more. As is now known only too well, the index was hopelessly inadequate. And as inflation soared from about 1970 onwards, anxieties increased. The situation was not helped by the fact that in the meanwhile, the total number of Tomcats to have been bought had been slashed to 313, driving up the aircraft's unit cost dramatically. Flight testing involving some 20 aircraft continued through 1971 and 1972. The first supersonic sortie was made on the 16th of September, 1971 by the 12th aircraft, which had taken over the duties of the first prototype. The trials were intensive and involved an unusually large number of aircraft in order to meet the deadline for delivering the Tomcat to operational squadrons. Navy preliminary evaluation got underway towards the end of 1971, putting the aircraft through simulated carrier approaches, shunting them around flight decks, down carrier lifts, and around hangars to try out their compatibility with the big ships, which would eventually be their home, and following up with shipboard catapult takeoffs and arrested landings. The business of testing out the complex weapon systems of the F-14 began the following year at Point Magoo. And here, particular interest centered on the big AIM-54 Phoenix missile, which was the aircraft's major feature. The results were astonishing. Ready. Ready. On. Missiles away. Drones modified to simulate all manner of Soviet aircraft were intercepted with amazing success and at unheard of ranges. In one spectacular trial, for example, a drone doing Mach 1.5 at 50,000 feet was on the receiving end of a Phoenix launched 120 miles away. In another test, with a ripple salvo of AIM-54 spread across about half a minute, four targets were successfully intercepted at ranges varying between 30 and 50 miles.